All right, welcome back to the program. You're watching NTV AM live this morning as we take a look at what's making headlines across the country and also beyond our borders. And of course, uh, today we'll be having a, a bit of a focus on, uh, and this is on this segment, uh, the royal visit by King Charles III and Queen Camilla here in the country who are on their second day of the four-day state visit. Yesterday they were received by President William Ruto at State House. A number of issues cropping up from that. We've had uh, statements from different uh, sectors and stakeholders. Uh, one from the Kenya Human Rights Commission on Sunday. We've had from different uh, uh, community elders as well, the Kipsigis elders, the Wapokot uh, elders as well, speaking on issues of land injustices, issues of Operations, if issues of compensation coming from uh, the historical past that the two nations uh, had to face specifically on the colonial past and uh, that era, the, state, the emergency period uh, that really uh, has been a huge mark on this country's history. Now, yesterday, King Charles III did acknowledge that history between Kenya and the United Kingdom was long and complex and that relationship in the past has been what he termed as a great sorrow and deep uh, cause of, of great sorrow and deep regret and of course this was when he was speaking at a state banquet at state house yesterday let's just quickly listen to what the king had to say it is the intimacy of our shared history that has brought our people together however we must also acknowledge the most painful times of our long and complex relationship. The wrongdoings of the past are a cause of the greatest sorrow and the deepest regret. There were abhorrent and unjustifiable acts of violence committed against Kenyans as they waged, as you said at the United Nations, a painful struggle for independence and sovereignty. And for that, there can be no excuse. In coming back to Kenya, it matters greatly to me that I should deepen my own understanding of these wrongs and that I meet some of those whose lives and communities were so grievously affected. None of this can change the past, but by addressing our history with honesty and openness, we can perhaps demonstrate the strength of our friendship today. And in so doing, we can, I hope, continue to build an ever closer bond for the years ahead. As Jomo Kenyatta said, our children may learn about the heroes of the past. Our task is to make ourselves the architects of the future. All right, so that's just part of uh, the King's speech yesterday at the State Banquet uh, at State House in front of all the dignitaries who are there. And of course, he's uh, talked about that, not sort of brushing over really what happened. There have been calls for the King to make a public apology uh, for the atrocities that were meted out on Kenyans, especially during uh, the struggle for independence. Uh, Professor... Fred Ogola, when you're looking at uh, that particular statement that the you know the king made, um, aside from the fact that he says that he wants to sit down and understand you know uh, that history that you know has sort of even binded the two nations, he did not make what you know we've we've had calls for him to make a public apology that that he did not reach to that extent. But what do you make of his sentiments? at this particular time and you know as Kenya now reaches 60 years of independence does it make any does it have any significance some weight on on, on our relationship with the UK yeah first of all like uh, my brother said that his visit is very significant uh, especially it's a score for William Ruto really in his first uh, year mm -hmm. uh, to host the head of Commonwealth no. And also, that is the first time he's visiting a, a, a Commonwealth nation, and mm -hmm. it's been done with style and fashion. Right. So, in the optics side, is okay, and uh, that is a PR thing. But now, let's go to where things really matter. He has stated that his mother entered in this country as a princess and left as a queen. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And it says that the Kenya has, holds, uh, Kenya is special to the monarchy. Now, when you talk about special to the monarchy, what are we supposed to be getting if we are special to the monarchy as compared to other nations of the Commonwealth? Um, uh, Zainab, if you want to go to UK, you want a UK visa, it's harder for you to get a UK visa than to go to the US. US mm -hmm. never colonizes. Uh, I've gone to Spain much easier applying for it. Even the pages of uh, applying for the visa to UK is harder. There's a time I was a student in, U in US. I was a student in Spain, by the way. Mm -hmm. Then I booked British Airways. Then I was on flight to, 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 uh, to Kenya through Heathrow. When we were half the way the flight between Barcelona and uh, London, I was told that I did not have a transit visa. So they told me they have to deport me. I told them now, then take me back to Kenya. They said, no, we are taking you back to Spain. So I was flown back to Spain just because I did not have a transit visa just to be at the airport and take another flight from Heathrow back to Nairobi. So would that be a relationship between a colonizer and the, and, 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 and the colonized? Getting a visa to UK, getting job permits to UK, is it easier for Kenyan than any other person? Trade between Kenya and UK, is it more enhanced or not? Remember even our flowers go to Europe via Amsterdam. So for us now, we as Kenyans, we want to see, can we put bread on the table easily, take a child to school easily, have health care easily because of uh, UK? During the COVID-19, where were they for us? Because just mentioning my mother was here, those are optics. We are concerned about the real thing. Now, when you go to the question of the apology, let me tell you, Zainab, I, this is where maybe me and Wakili may differ. It does not matter whether or not he apologizes because it can actually be just a sentimental statement that means nothing. But if you ask me, read the history of Britain, how they write their history. They are proud that they colonized the world. And in fact, they, they are proud that they colonized Kenya. Uh, if the brutalities and the, the pain that was created in Kenya is something they are ashamed of, their history should not be written with pride. In fact, if you go to London, uh, which is a rich cultural city, right, a very rich cultural city, you live in sea monuments showing that this is a, a, it's pride that they colonized Kenya. And if uh, slavery, uh, colonialism was something to be ashamed about, brutalities was something to be ashamed about, I don't think that it will be put in some part of the UK tradition that is very good. I'm happy that the president took him to the to Huru Gardens, where the heroes who died were buried. For us, it is not something we are proud about there, isn't it? It is something that we mourn about, something we want to remember, something that happened. If you go to, uh, if, you, if you go along Gong Road, actually there's also a cemetery there for the people who died for uh, fighting for independence of the country. So uh, for me, do, if they are able to acknowledge uh, and really feel sorry for what happened, it's more important than apology. And when they tell the story about colonization, it's told by pride. In fact, uh, they would even call us an extension and appendage of, 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 of Britain. And let me tell you what, Britain, among all countries, have one of the best sewer system and water system in the world. Do you know why? Nairobi only has 3% of the sewer system it needs. To do a sewer system, you need to th steal money from somebody else. And the resources that were depleted and were taken to Britain that has made Britain the big and most powerful empire of the world. Even the Bible says that if you want to go and confess and you have stolen somebody's thing, return. So what is it that is being returned? What the, is the activity they are doing? Are they going to say that because of the people who died of slavery, now the people, for example, who have never been compensated, the victims of Mau Mau, some of them have died in poverty, some of them have died in desperate situations. Can they put education plan for them? Can they ensure they secure these people's lives? So as part of the calls for sort of reparations yeah. for, for so those who suffered? There's, there's what they call apology, what they call reparations. Take mm -hmm. us back to where we were. The amount of aid they are giving us, isn't it, is not equivalent to how much they took. Mm -hmm. And as an economist, uh, Zainab, on 2nd of, actually tomorrow, I'm, I'm doing a public lecture on Solomonic economic model, and I've found out data that developed countries are financing, de develop, developing countries are financing developed countries. And I've found data that 
in 2022 alone, 1.3 trillion came from developed countries coming to developing countries. Right. And in the same year, 3.3 trillion mm -hmm. came from developing countries to developed countries, meaning that developed countries are developing countries are financing them. But we are being told here that we are the one being held in aid. Now he's coming to announce very big things which I'll do, which is about so those optics, but, but his visit as a monarch is suddenly more of symbolic uh, you know cultural event when it comes to the issue of you know uh, perhaps economic or political responsibility, it falls on the Prime Minister. So uh, wouldn't this no, but you a, see, a responsibility before on you the take monarch? office? Mm -hmm. You know, before it was Queen Elizabeth, if a prime minister is elected, before you take oath of office, you go to the king. Before you went to the queen, they have some powers and they have negotiation powers. Remember, the, 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 the prime minister's office finances the monarchy. Like in Spain, when I was there, 10 million euros goes to the monarchy to manage it every year as a budget. And even on this one, even his visit, and even all those promises come from the budget which is given. And remember also they lobby for their budgets mm -hmm. to, uh, from the Prime Minister's office. So they can look for how they can lobby for many things. All remember, right. they have influence. They have influence in many ways. Okay. So according to me, we want to have better discussion between an adult mm -hmm. and adult. Mm -hmm. Not a big brother versus a small brother. All right. The West should know that Kenya is mature enough to have head-on discussion. That's why I am ashamed when I saw the VC in State House looking like State House have been overtaken. Now, when Obama comes here, the U.S. president coming here, they should not look like they've overtaken Kenya. They should come to visit the way we visit. Mm -hmm. They should come and let us control Isn't our country. Isn't that the ceremony that we always see when, when, when the president does receive other heads of state and dignitaries as well? Prof, but uh, Anyway, what we'll I'm trying to say, that. I want a mature discussion okay. mm -hmm. between developing countries mm -hmm with the developed nations All right. rather than peer. I am concerned about the goodies it brings to the country All right. rather than the small peer. You can visit a women group here and give them handouts or you can talk about the issue of putting small funds okay. in education. But does that change the country's destiny? All right, That's let's hear from uh, Maliba on that, then I'll get to you. Uh, Bashir, you know, you, you're the one who suggested we start with Prof, so you, you'll go last. <laughs> yes, Maliba. I think, uh, first of all, I'll start where Prof left on the apology. Uh, the question on apology would be, where does it end? There should have been a framework on how we go about this issue of uh, uh, colonialism. Mm -hmm. First of all, they were not supposed to be here. And I like it when Prof says that uh, uh, Britain is actually built on stolen wealth. And the entire conceptual West, as it is, exists. That thing we admire in the West is a making of two things, free labor from Africa and resources. Uh, that is both the minerals, the agriculture that they got from here. So when you look at the West and admire them, they did not have the material wealth mm -hmm. or even the human resource in numbers to achieve what they got so early. A lot of it is what our ancestors put in. So when you talk about uh, reparations, yes, we've actually gotten a little bit of reparations and compensations in the past. A good, but to what level? You are only looking at the people who are injured, killed, raped, and such, right? Have they done reparations? And have they compensated us for the resources they took away? Have they compensated what they gained out of the free labor they took out of our ancestors? They definitely have not. So when we talk about compensation, a lot of it we forget that they took out, even when they were building the railway, the railway was actually supposed to get to the hinterland, to get the raw material, to take it to Europe for manufacturing. And the prosperity remained there. A little bit of it, there was a trickle-down effect, and we've remained with that for a long time until this government came in. So with that, if you're going to talk about an apology, there should be an end in mind. We don't have a framework on how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, this is how I've thought about it. Then I wasn't there. That first of all, independence was to kick them out. They were not supposed to be here. Number two, uh, the issue of an apology, not that it's entirely uh, not important, but for me it will be an initial important step to great accountability. So that are they willing to account for everything else? There are a lot of artifacts that are missing. There are a lot of our ancestors who are killed and their skulls and bones are kept in museums elsewhere against their will. They have been denied the tradition where our people would be buried whole 
in their own compounds with their own people. Mm -hmm. A lot of our people are not there. So if this apology will be opening up for a better accountability, and you know the British are so good with words. So when the, when the king says that he's here to gain a deeper understanding, this is a chap who grew up in the monarchy itself, deeper. So what deeper understanding is it? For the British, I think that is a polite way of saying uh, this thing should be allowed to lie low. So um, the apology is not coming because once you actually put out the apology, then you have to take up responsibility for what happened in the days of old. Mm -hmm. And the British, the Britain we have today, the UK we have today is not the same as the one we met. You remember when uh, they were at the peak, when Britain was at its peak, uh, they used to say they are the empire on which the sun doesn't set. And some cheeky German said, it's true, the sun never sets on Britain because God does not trust them in darkness. So we, we are at a place where they are not willing to actually get into a shed of an apology and walk back. Uh, we can actually forgive the king because he's an innocent inherit uh, heir to a process he might not really have been uh, really to blame for. <coughs> but then over and above the apology, if we are asking for an apology, we must actually have a clear, elaborate process. Where does it end? How does it move around? Mm -hmm. But uh, the king is here. He will not be touching on that so much. Of course, the president has done so well. You know, I actually envy the diplomatic team that is managing this particular visit. Mm -hmm. This one is a very difficult visit to actually manage because you are walking on eggshells. There are things you can't say, there are things you can't appear to be doing because uh, Britain and Kenya have had a long, hard and uh, complex, as they a say. complex relationship. Right. This one, but you see, it's that kind of relationship. Have you, when I was growing up, there are people you will see, the man and woman don't look compatible at all, but they live together. So you will be like, how do these people get along? That is how Kenya and the UK have actually been mm -hmm. getting along. So. There are, of course, economic discussions that are on the table. What we are talking about now, about uh, colonialism and everything else, mm -hmm. is not so high up there on the agenda. They're talking about uh, the Grand Falls uh, Dam, about 400 billion shillings. The Nairobi City Railway, about 11.1 .1 billion shillings uh, that they are putting in. Uh, the green investment, I think uh, there's also a number of uh, money coming in. Uh, there is also a geothermal project that they're actually putting in billions. So there's quite a number of projects that uh, the king will be talking about. Also talking to young people and everything else around that so but then the history part of it is important mm -hmm. so we we are at a place where even as you look at this particular conversation it needs to be larger than narrower on compensation let us not really commercialize the conversation around what really happened for example uh, amongst my people i would be a king today if the british had not shown up so how do they compensate me for missing out because they interrupted our way of life how do you quantify that so that then i can also get my reparations mm -hmm. it's not just about our culture was lost we are here speaking eloquently in English. So th there's much more to actually be dealt with. Then there is a lot of data these people collected in this country, part of our history. It's kept in archives. If you look at Levi's uh, Opio's uh, page on social media, he keeps on stumbling on very important information. Mm -hmm. uh, they also authored our history here. Uh, somebody like Dillings went to Western for 14 days and he wrote the entire history of the Kisses, the Luos and the Luyas and any other thing that was living in what then was looked at as Cavirondo. Uh -huh. 14 days in a region and he wrote the entire history and then until uh, Bethel God showed up and then he would be told, you ca we cannot use yours. Uh, using oral literature is not academic. We cannot use that as a basis upon which then somebody can record history. And he was like, this is the way of my people. So uh, once we talk about heroes of this country, when we talk about where, I don't know what his place in the museum is, mm -hmm. but I think uh, Bethel Ogot is actually a hero of how we actually have tried to redefine our history. So mm -hmm. there's much to do. A lot of the archives they have in, the Brit in, in Britain, they need to bring it back. We need that data because we need to also know a lot of the data they picked and then classified it. And isn't that the reason why then historians say, uh, you know, and this is part of what you're calling for, you know, we need to have back the data that, you know, they, they've collected in Kenya, uh, some of the artifacts as well that yes. was here in Kenya, is that with, with the history of, you know, colonialism, we cannot brush over the past, that we must look back to be able to look ahead. It's important. Right? We must look back because the person who does not know where he's come from he most definitely doesn't know where he is and cannot lie to you that they know where they are going. Okay. So it's good to look back. 
But I'm saying, even as we ask for compensation, reparations, and apology, do we have an entire framework to ensure that there is a little bit of justice around this? Okay. So that's why I'm actually talking about things like the archives, the information that is around there. Right. There's much more than compensations and an apology. All right. I asked a question, where does it end? We need a proper, if the apology opens up a window for greater accountability, mm -hmm. the better. But All if right. it's just an end in itself, it doesn't really account for much. All right. Yeah. Yes, Bashir. I, I think Zainab, the reason as to why there's a lot of discussions around um, the question of apology by the, by the king mm -hmm. is because um, just before his visit, the, the Sun, which is a famous newspaper in the, in the UK, had actually did a, did a story about his visit to, to Africa, especially to Kenya, and actually s stated that he will not apologize, but he will merely acknowledge the painful aspect of the UK-Kenya relationship. Away from that again, uh, in April 2023, the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, mm -hmm. appeared before the UK Parliament. He was asked whether the UK should apologize mm -hmm. to Africa for this for the slavery and brutality. Mm -hmm. He said, demand, I mean, issuing an apology will amount to unpicking our history, which is not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Just to take you back, there's a time I think the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, appeared before the UK Parliament. The question was, was the same. He was asked, should we apologize for the brutality met on Africans, the likes of Kenya? He said, no. Again, Tony, Tony Blair before that, equally said there is no point of apologizing. That's why the question on apologies and uh, the king's acknowledgement of the painful relationship is something even that was in the UK newspapers. It was foreseen that when he visits Kenya, he will not apologize. He will merely acknowledge the painful aspects of our relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, the bigger issue again was in the UK. Again, they tried to analyze what this particular acknowledgement of the painful relationships, what does it mean? So the, the conclusion was that the king is merely acknowledging that the brutality and the slavery met on the people of Kenya was sanctioned or was anchored by British policies. Mm -hmm. One of the policies being what is called the, it is famous in law school, it's called the British Settlements Act of 1887. Mm -hmm. That is now one of the legal frameworks that was put in place that provided cover to these particular soldiers who have who have made Africans and Kenyans suffer, especially the, the, what, what they call the emergency period in Kenya between 1952 and 1960. So I will say the reason as to why the bigger discussion at the moment centers around an apology is because very many times the prime ministers of UK declined to offer such an apology. Mm -hmm. Again, just to, take, to, to, to bring uh, to the attention of this able panel, is that uh, between the 14th and 17th of November 2023, there is a discussion that will be held in Accra, Ghana, whereby most Caribbean nations and African states mm -hmm. have been invited to have a discussion that centers around the question of reparations and justice for the victims of brutality under the hands of the British uh, soldiers during the, the colonial time. So it is a lively issue, which I think for me I will say, what he did yesterday, he did not apologize. He really did what the sun newspaper back in his country predicted in terms of an acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Then we are told he's here to have a deeper understanding of the painful aspects of a relationship. What kind of deeper understanding? You know, the understanding is everywhere. It is known that the people of Kenya, in the name of saying that they're going to finish Mau Mau, between 1915 and 1960 have suffered within their hands. Was, the, was one of the worst atrocities actually yes. meted out on, on, on former colonies. Correct. Or, or and and you can imagine what raping does, torture, cruelty, victimization of every form, detentions without any trial. And these laws actually were sanctioned mm -hmm. by those particular laws back in London. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've given you that particular example of the British Settlements Act of 1887. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when you even look at what has actually transpired um, in that particular case whereby some Kenyans uh, had filed a test suit that has actually granted a certain little, actually what in my view is about 2 billion Kenya shillings equivalent of reparations, that particular time, the reason as to why they decided to settle out of court, they knew if that matter would have been had to conclusion, it would have set a precedent for more, for very many lawsuits to be filed. Mm -hmm. And that time, actually, the British government filed two objections, trying to frustrate that case. But now it is the judge who has actually, at that particular time, said there are very many policies and documents that show back here in London that is what had sanctioned the particular sufferings that were made on the people. That's what I'm saying. It will not be bad for the king when he's in the country to do that particular 
apology. Mm -hmm. uh, look at what is happening in Barbados. Look at what's happening in Jamaica. Some countries are actually thinking of uh, moving their way out of, finding a way of getting out of the 56 member state of what is called the Commonwealth member states, which the king again heads. That's what I'm saying. It's a lively issue. And it's right. going to be the main discussion between 14th and 17th in Accra, Ghana. So what we're asking for is he hasn't apologized. The people of Kenya have suffered in the hands of the British. And again, just look at what has happened in 2012. All right. The British soldier had actually killed a Kenyan lady. We know that story. Nothing has been done of late. Why? It's because there is a two-level agreement, a bilateral agreement between the members, between UK and Kenya, that says British soldiers who are back here in Kenya should not be I mean, criminal proceedings should not be leveled against I th them. I think there was These an amendment in, in Parliament in, that yes, was actually ratified. Yes, and again, the Foreign really Committee also had picked up that discussion last year, I remember. But I'm saying there are very many sticky issues that still need to be discussed. What the actual operations in Kenya, what it's about, the kind of chemicals they're using, the weapon, there are many dark issues that we still need to have unraveled. Okay. Yes. All right. And, that, and that's literally uh, that issue on, on the British troops here in Kenya in terms of the defense agreement. Uh, we have to take a break. Prof, when we come back, we'll continue with this conversation. And of course, also looking at uh, this particular opportunity and what it means for Kenya and also just the geopolitical, uh, you know, interests that Kenya might uh, uh perhaps get you know involved in in terms of this particular visit all right let's take a quick break i'm live we'll be back in a short while Deal. Now with new Infinity Fresh technology, antibacterial power with 48 hour protection, and long lasting freshness. Nivea Fresh Deal. Feel fresh in every moment. Try new Nivea Fresh Sensation Deal. Our freshest fragrance with 72 hour antiperspirant protection. Candace, what's that? I brought you a small bonus. Bonus for what? You got us 299 family dinners. 64 kisses on the cheek, 12 road trips to see grandma, 42 jokes from daddy, 49 laughs from mommy. In over 60 years of dealing with numbers, we've learned that the numbers that matter the most to you are the ones that matter the most to us. NCBA Bank. Go for it. Going back into European competition, and into the Champions League no less, was a long time coming for Newcastle fans. The chance of a run into and through the knockout stages might leave some of them feeling a little greedy. Except Newcastle has put itself in position to do just that, even after suffering a disappointing home loss. Being consistently competitive, beating the elite teams and rising to the top of the Champions League might be one of the hardest tasks in football. Now consider Newcastle's place in the Champions League. Returning after a gap of 21 years and drawn in Group F with PSG, Borussia Dortmund and AC Milan. Win a three-bedroom house in Nanyuki, sitting on a quarter acre or a 30k weekly shopping voucher or a monthly plot for every 100k you spend. Buying or paying for your plot, you earn one entry to the draw. The more you invest, the more entries you get. Bamba Nyumba na AMG.
All right, welcome back to the program. You're watching M Live this morning as we continue with the conversation on the royal visit here in the country, King Charles III, on his second day of the four day state visit. And of course, uh, interesting things. We'll be having a look at uh, the itinerary today. Some of our, uh, my colleagues are around uh, the city, will be giving us an update on exactly what are some of the things that uh, will be happening today. Olive Barrows also uh, preparing herself, will be also joining us at around 9 a.m., will be telling us what's happening and of course following up on uh, the visits uh, that King Charles III and Queen Camilla will be making here in the county. Now, uh, Prof, uh, w w I know you wanted to mention something. We're still back to the issue of um, the apology that you know many have called uh, for the king to make. But then uh, very quickly, uh, we've said, you know, that's sort of not happened. Yeah. And uh, we, are, we, we we've seen that... Uh, the statement coming from the king himself and the communication from uh, Britain is that there is only going to be an acknowledgement of yeah, those particular yeah. atrocities. This doesn't change much. We've had the conversations and the statements coming from Mau Mau veterans, uh, some of those who feel like uh, there was still injustice that has not been, uh, you know, the justice has not been, you know, uh, meted out on them. So. What, what what way forward then? What How do we move forward? Yeah, you see, uh, Zainab, I'm a typical Kenyan. Grew up in a very typical Kenyan family. And I want to give you an analogy how elders normally apologize. Mm -hmm. In my culture, if the father of the home beats a wife who has tried to pluck one of the tree from the fence, normally the wife might be chased home, then later there's a case. Then later, uh, one way to apologize to the wife will tell her, my dear, you are trying to get fired. Why don't you pluck that tree from the fence, use it for cooking uh, for guests? If the very thing that made you be beaten, you are now you are being given permission to do, shows there is some kind of uh, forgiveness under the, that kind of apology. Because the history of apology, like uh, Wakili has said, is long. Even the Pope has been told to apologize for what the church did against many people. Even the church itself has never apologized mm -hmm. for many things they have done. So it's a serious issue. I'm not saying that you can't apologize. But let me, ask, let me tell you what. If the king did certain things that are expect, Kenya are expecting people to be happier. For example, UK is known to be an epicenter for sports. Premier League is the most watched Premier League in the world. Now, Kenya, we have a struggling Premier League. If UK came here to build the sports industry using the King's visit to link the cultural side, which is sports, and ensure that we build the infrastructure, we help Kenya with some kind of capacity building around it, invest it, come with exchange program, for example, the young people who are playing talent academies visit UK, play in Barcelona, play in, uh, let's say, Arsenal, play in Manchester United. This is structural support. But carrying 8 million shillings to give a head of state that he might eat, we don't know where he's going to take the money. He might, we might not see that money. Corruption is real in Kenya. It's not helpful. Pro is that a fair assessment? No, no, I'm of, saying of, we, we, uh, we, 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 we don't know what will that money will actually do because corruption is a real thing in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you create an exchange program between, like say, if they went to Premier League Kenya, uh, they went to Gormahia, they went to Sofapaka, they went to AFC Leopard, look for young talents, do an exchange program in between them, it will help a child in Kenya practically and right now. For me, I believe that will be uh, something more substantial. The other thing is we have things like curios. Most of the British people who lived here, they like to buy things which are Kenyan on the wrist break. They will enjoy that. So we have a curio sector here that many support so many women. Go to Maasai market. You see women selling things which are typical Kenyan, uh, let's say, uh, things. If so th find that basically then falls under the diplomatic ties that these two countries... Yes, but I'm trying to right? say... The economic ties yeah, so that I'm they saying do share. If the visit was arranged around how to make Kenya trade more and enhance the business of people, remember the Korea I'm talking about, there's no government effort to do it. It's Kenyan personal initiative. Maasai market, is there, did you see any government minister setting it up? It was set up by typical Kenyan. The, I even know somebody called the chairperson of Maasai markets in Kenya. He's just a Kenyan like me. So this for me will be structural. It will address matter. And then if I just cap it up with, the, with this matter, this visit, was it Kenya who arranged it, or is UK who arranged it? But it if was Kenyan an, arranged at the invitation of President no, no. William Bruto, right? Well, uh, uh, invitation is one thing. 
But a Kenya should arrange the visit according to its national interest. What are the nascent, I'm an economist, what are the nascent industries in Kenya that you can piggy bank and run on the UK establishment but, and Prof, work? I go back to the question of the fact that the king, is, as the head of state, does not control the economy of the United Kingdom. That you, falls you right. literally on the government, it which starts is from there. the prime minister but, uh, who's heading uh, the Zainab, government. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was approached so that Jesus can perform a miracle. And Mary... Even as a Catholic, we pray to Mary so that Mary's prayers go to Jesus. So the king is like the Mary who takes her prayer to the prime minister. They are not disconnected. Okay. In fact, they say there's nothing that you can ever pass through the mother. And the mother except the son can do. Go to my mother today. My mother is not there, but I'm sure. So those who have mothers. If my mother tells me, Fred, do one, Maliba, you'll do. Because you won't have peace. Your mother will tell you, for example, when you are growing up, when my brother does not want to help me in school fees, my will say, Fred, Fred, my brother, help Fred, he wants X, Y, Z. They'll right. do it. So okay. this can happen. And then lastly, to, true to your words I told Maliba, as the king was good with the words like Maliba have said, I sent you something there uh, that says that what British say, what they mean, and what you think they mean. Mm -hmm. When a British son says that you are very brave, isn't it? You might think he says that uh, you have courage, but they mean you must be out of your mind to suggest me such a thing. So there's a, a, a narrative list we have done of 50 things that when a British says this, this is what they mean, and this is what they say. Okay, when a so British says, tells you, right. uh, Zainab, I would, you are a very nice guy. I would like to invite you for dinner. For you, you are thinking that you are waiting for dinner invitation. They just mean that I'm being pleasant. You are a nice person. But there's no dinner invitation at all. Those are nuances so, of language. Yes. So, so right. the use of language to hide what you okay. want to mean is the reason why language was founded. And right. British are very good with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will get to uh, Maliba. I mean, <clears throat> I want to just change the trajectory a little bit in terms of... Uh, the geopolitical implication as well. Uh, President William Ruto is fresh from a visit in China. Uh, he did meet with the president of China, and uh, this was an issue of economic ties as well. Do you think, uh, you know, with this visit by the king, because UK has a lot of interest in Kenya as well, economically speaking, how does Kenya remain keen on avoid being sort of pigeonholed, you know, uh, into any geopolitical grouping, if, if, if I may call it that? You know, first of all, uh, I think I would answer your question first of all by pointing out what we missed as a nation mm -hmm. or what we are missing in this particular visit. Uh, number one, 60 years after we gained independence, we were hoping that when we, we have got the king, our, our former colonial master visiting, we should be in a position to actually demonstrate what we have done for ourselves. Uh, that has, of course, this is cultural and everything else. This is the king and everything around that. But it's important to also point out trade-wise that uh, the colonial history has actually shrouded uh, the trade, the bilateral conversations that uh, the king and the president have been having and uh, what anchors his visit here. So I will just mention a few that, number one, uh, what is on the, uh, on the meeting, uh, or rather what is on the agenda, number one, is to discuss... Uh, uh, a 425 billion Grand High Falls Dam that the British are actually uh, funding. Uh, they'll also be discussing 12.5 uh, billion shillings of Menengai uh, geothermal project. Uh, then there is the 7.5 billion shillings Malindi solar, uh, solar uh, plant expansion. There's the additional uh, 11.5 billion shillings I mentioned that earlier on of uh, the Nairobi City uh, project that uh, railway city railway city the project that we are doing. There is 31 billion shillings United Green investment, and uh, of course uh, the recruitment of Kenyan nurses to to the UK. This is on the table. It's being discussed, but our history is quite heavy. That's why it's shrouding everything else. Prof has ably said that uh, the British, with good words, are actually at the top. No one beats them. After all, uh, Britain is the home of great towering uh, uh, literature giants like uh, Oliver Twist, uh, Shakespeare, and all those great poets. They know how to get around words, including he, him being a lawyer who will tell you <laughs> that uh, it's the British who has taught lawyers to play around with words and are so good at giving an answers uh, so well. So when uh, the king says that he's here for a deeper understanding, the British will call that uh, an interesting statement. Uh, so what is interesting <laughs> about it? <laughs> so for them, they are masters of non-answers. 
stupefying issues and just running away where they don't want commitment. So they can do stuff and still get away with it. So uh, you said it was just beautiful language that yeah, didn't really by have well, any that, uh, that This one should let these things lie down. So mm -hmm. at least on the economic end, there is that. But then, 60 years down the line, there are three things that Kenya has actually grown. The truth is that Kenya has gained a little bit of agency. We can do a few things for ourselves. Uh, Kenya has gained a little bit of voice. We can speak up, you have seen, and we are not afraid of anything. Kenya also has got choice. That then speaks to you talking about uh, going to the East, going back to the Orient, the Occident, then also being part and parcel of uh, the Unaligned. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah having said that we are neither East nor West, we move forward. But then the point is this, that we also missed out things. And this for me uh, is quite personal, that uh, I know that uh, this looks like a Commonwealth event. But among the things that we have done for ourselves and what we hope to bequeath to our children could be things about the East African community. I know there is protocol, there is tradition, and there is everything else. But why on earth did we miss, and no one will stop us, because we have got agency, voice, and choice. Uh, why did we, for example, not find ways of strengthening the East African community by playing the national anthem, uh, the East African uh, community anthem, for example? Uh, guys will tell you this is not an, uh, a Commonwealth event, this is the tradition and how we do everything else. The ESC flag was flying on top of State House, even as we did that. We should have honored and strengthened. And the president has been quite uh, uh, Afrocentric and a Pan-Africanist, at least largely. So. Uh, on this one, we missed out. No one would have actually killed us if we played the East African anthem there. To actually say that this is part and parcel of what we are building and doing for ourselves, that goes a long way. This is me speaking. Uh, secondly, again, uh, the president has been a, a Pan-Africanist, and I think that uh, uh, missing out on his traditional Kaunda suit for me, uh, I take it personal, it should actually have featured. Because <laughs> honestly, uh, these, these are some of the things we have done for ourselves, and it's about small things. Don't, not, but I, I, I have I mentioned. Mean, I mean, the president. I have mentioned the billions that are actually on the table and everything else. But if this is but symbolic, the, does the president's dressing have any impact? I'm, I'm talking about that? symbolic. It's about symbolic, right? right. So uh, the symbolism, these small things, the EAC anthem, for example, playing around there. Uh, but then you will realize that there is a splitting image between uh, Britain. That is how colonialism, even as we look at it. Do you know that a lot of the problems we've been discussing around here are very British? The Kenyan corruption you see here is very British corruption. While they went away, we, st we stayed with not just their language, their culture and even their bad manners. They came here, they grabbed land. A lot of people are still grabbing land here. Uh, the British are actually quite uh, classically the corrupt people. Uh, that has remained with us. So, so we've also would, picked up the you bad manners. How the nature of corruption to I will, people I'm, I'm telling you, it's a culture. It takes, a, it takes 25 years to people. actually come up with a new culture. I told the you. other bit, they actually need to, to actually just bring in, forget Prof. Prof is uh, not a good man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's trying to he ensure that. No I don't speak. In Kenya, then again no, I didn't say that. I'm right. just saying that a few of those things that we actually picked up from the British, mm -hmm. part and parcel of it is that they left a culture for us that might not be so good and compatible with the way we are doing things. Right. So, as uh, we move on, I really thought that you should look at this. The Britain we are meeting today is not the British our ancestors were fighting against. This looks like a miracle to what our ancestors, our great-grandfathers were fighting against. Yesterday, the king landed at an airport, most likely recently refurbished by the Chinese. He used an expressway that has been done by the Chinese. Mm. He was driving in a Land Rover Discovery, which is actually an Indian car. And the escort were LC 150J, Land Cruiser 150J, Japanese. The only thing that was British was himself and the language he was using. That is not the Britain our ancestors were actually fighting. At independence, Britain was actually our number one trading partner and supporter. Today, it's actually slipped to number six. That also reflects where they are in the world today. Mm -hmm. So even as we move around, let us just remember that this is not right. what our ancestors were fighting against. And a lot of our ancestors never thought that there would be a point where we are having bilateral on equal level, because in the days of old, they will send us a governor who is not even equivalent to a member of parliament in their country. Mm -hmm. Today, they are sending us the king. So there's been a little bit of progress on our side. We also need to talk about where we have actually been and where we are going. As and an I hope right. that as we celebrate 60 years, we should be able to exhibit mm -hmm. what we have done for ourselves. All right. And the numbers will actually bear us out on that. We've done well, 
uh, we can talk about history, and when we talk about our independence and history, we should not limit ourselves to talking about the dark side also. The dark side should actually be uh, our way of also reflecting what we have done well and the light side of this particular process. All right. Yeah. And Wakili Bashir, uh, Bashir as, you, as you also wind up on this conversation, you know, pre the president has really been seeking to get a foothold in the global stage and then you have now the king visiting Kenya. Uh, what, what are some of the political you know, implication of this? Does it have any impact or, or on the president himself, mm -hmm. as you know, as a leader of, of this country? Yeah, actually, Zainab, um, it's true that uh, the president, uh, President Ruto, has actually been trying to brand himself mm -hmm. as a president, not just uh, as the Kenyan president, but rather as an icon for Africa. Mm -hmm. He actually many times tried to, to shed the light on various African issues, African problems, mm -hmm. and African conversations. Uh, um, the way I think he has uh, welcomed the, the king, it's quite crucial, it's quite important. Mm -hmm. Actually, some Kenyans were making a joke out of it. They were saying, had it not been the king coming, the pres our president possibly would be out of the country. Mm -hmm. But I'll say, in as much as we are receiving the king at the moment, the bigger conversation or the most crucial things for me are about what these particular foreign secretaries who are in uh, the government of UK, whatever goodies they are bringing us, whatever um, agreements we are signing, whatever grants they are granting us, these are the important things to me. Yesterday, actually, I saw a Kenyan lady who was asking, uh, who, was, who was addressing the media. So she was like, Tunaomba King akifika pia maisha yende chini. You see, that's how desperate the situation is. That's how dire the situation is. If there are certain uh, uh, bilateral agreements that the two governments are going to enter into, let those be people-centered things. In terms of the king visiting uh, Kenya, it's a, he's, a, he's the symbolic head of all Commonwealth nations. He, is, uh, he may not make certain crucial decisions, but those who are with him, those who are from the office of the prime minister, are the yeah. people who are important to us economically. Mm -hmm. What am I saying about the African culture? The African culture, unlike what Maliba has alluded to, is rich. It is known all over the world. We, I, I, as Africa and as Kenya, we stand out because of our culture. Mm -hmm. it, it has not been eroded. We are trying to stick onto it and try as much as we can to, to live with it. Mm -hmm. In terms of what is happening with Britain, the economy is not doing well. Uh, they are do, yeah, they're doing actually so badly. That is why we are finding ourselves now facing the Chinese way. Go to the JKIA, stand at the, at the, at the international arrivals. You'll be surprised every day by how many, Kenya, how many Chinese are coming into Kenya. That tells you what is happening economically between Kenya and China. That is now where, th that is the side we are facing, our, we are finding our way because we are not doing well also as a country. So our government and the way it is also, it has a lot of appetite for loans and what have you, we have found the easier and softer spot in terms of focus. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of UK, whatever good is it's dishing to us, it is dwindling, it is diminishing and not as promising as before. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are, we are, as Kenyans, we are hospitable, we will receive him, he will have his, his four days in Kenya and we'll be happy to see him off as the king. Mm -hmm. What will remain with us will remain with us. Whatever goods he will leave with us, our only request is that that little amount of money should be pursued by the UK government to ensure that they seek for evaluation and monitoring. If they leave three billion, for example, Kenya shillings, I'm telling you that will not be used for whatever they have better, whatever they'll be interested in, 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 in having but the money. But why would for. you preempt that? Um, um, uh, it's because we are already mismanaging the little we're having as a country. <coughs> the little is getting misused and abused by the regime. Do you expect whatever goodies will be brought by a foreigner will be used properly? If we can't manage what we have, the little we have? No, I don't have, I don't have any, any expectations of that. But all, 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 all the same, we have exuded a lot of hospitality. The people of Mombasa will also welcome him. It will be a full great day of him being in our country. But before he leaves, what I'm saying is let him uh, give us the awaited apology. You, you make it look as though there are no accountability measures no, no, no. to manage you, 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 you know why? Is, is, is country, country, right? say this. Every time the Auditor General's report are subjected to Parliament, have you ever seen any action on those particular reports? No. Nothing, nothing happens. Read the Auditor General's report. They are so damning. There are revelations about what is happening at the county's level and at the national government levels. Nothing is happening in terms of actioning on the recommendations of those particular reports. Um, every single day, the kind of reports we see on the papers are what? Corruption, mismanagement of resources, scams, and plundering of resources. That's so all I'm the saying. cases that we've seen before the ESCC in terms of investigation. But, 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 but again, uh, since, since right. this regime has assumed office last year, have you seen more prosecutorial cases? Have you seen any files in terms of serious files of people being prosecuted? No. Actually, Uhuru's regime was way better in terms of 
trying to a little bit tackle corruption than this, than this one. This oh, one has, is imagined as the champion of corruption, unfortunately. Yes, if nothing know. was working, as Bashir puts it, and it saddens me that a young, a man so young as Bashir would be so great a preacher and poet of doom, you know, if nothing was working, we wouldn't be here. If nothing totally wasn't working, especially with where we were left, and he's a learned man, he has chosen to refuse completely mm -hmm. to apply his education. And he has chosen to be sentimental, to simply talk about heresies. And by the way, if I put him to a strict proof test, he's a lawyer, he will know that. He wouldn't actually substantiate what he's saying. But we shouldn't allow, I know times see, are hard, you see, you see things are Malibu, bad. I, I just need to actually finish this. Why I'm saying that is that you cannot say that nothing is happening. One year, for example, is not sufficient to actually judge this no, particular no, no, regime. The, the, same, the, the old cliche Things has started are working. are not being sufficient. All right. No, the truth is that whatever he's saying cannot, yes, cannot be proved. Now. All right, yes, Prof. Yeah. So, first of all, I told you earlier that uh, Maliba will shift you from the point. I think that Wakili did not talk about being a prophet of doom. He's talking about reality. And uh, Zainab, let me just put my, my hint here. World-class thinking, uh, world-class nation, world-class state begins with world, uh, talking about objective reality. Where are you? I'm sure even you, Zainab, to build your career in journalism where you are, they say, day you did a sort of what you're saying, say, this is where I am, then that's where I want to be. So what Wakil is doing, like, where are we as a nation? We, have, we are not having any prudence with the management of public resources. That's the truth. But is there a problem of this government, or is it a systemic problem? I said problem that this problem was planted in well. 1992. All right. Youth for Kanu 1992 is ruling. Kanu was to rule for how many years? Those ones, I think, Kanu is still ruling. So it was implanted a long time ago. I've told you, all those guys telling you they can solve the issue in Azimio. Martha Karua was a minister in, in, in a government, isn't it? Raila Odinga was a prime minister. Kalonzo Musyaka was a vice president. What is it that all of a sudden they have had this Damascus experience and all of a sudden they can solve the issues they have been part of creating? And Einstein says that you cannot solve a problem with the same tools you used to create them. So let's, let's just agree. Let me just say my point here. Uh, to close my discussion here is that, first of all, do you know the cost of hosting a king? Okay, you've counted the money he has brought, but do you know the cost of hosting a king? Mm -hmm. And also, in this discussion, something is missing. Raila Dinga's presence in State House has not been discussed. What mm -hmm. does significantly <laughs> does it make? Because at least in my lifetime, since election took place, it is the first time I'm seeing images of Raila Dinga in State House. Mm -hmm. Uh, what does Given that mean? this frosty relationship so they've shared me, with the president. If that is the case, maybe the visit of the king was sort of bringing peace between these two people, then what can peace give us? Mm -hmm. Peace is the most important thing on earth. That's why Linda Jamie, we're doing a national marathon, which is a peace marathon on okay. 9th of December. So I'm trying to say in short that if that is one thing you can count, then the other thing I want to talk about that mm -hmm. I want to urge the president. Because Very quickly, some, Prof. Yes, there's something you? missing here. What is missing is foreign policy. Mm -hmm. What is our foreign policy that can inform hosting a, a, a monarch like the king? Then also, Kenya needs to come with what is called a national dream, mm -hmm. a national a blueprint. So that when we are doing all these functions, talking to these guys, we are talking to these people in as far as they are taking us to where our true north is as a country. All right. What is our Kenyan vision, the Kenyan dream? Before we have a Kenyan dream as a people, right. and of all this is called identity politics, whereby me, Amilu, me, Amilu, those are small things. Let's focus on what is the national blueprint for Kenya, like American dream do exist. All right. And Obama told us in Nairobi University in his public lecture that every nation has a national interest. Okay. If I could ask Kenyans, what is yours? And if we don't have one, then our national interest could just be uh, tribal cocoons, it could be about corruption, it could not be about development, and I believe that Kenya needs to get better. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, thank you. Professor. Can I correct something but just in a minute and then allow Malibu, the, less than I a know minute. the producer is actually harassing you to ensure that you clear up. <laughs> First of all, I just needed to let uh, Professor know that there is no such thing as Nairobi University, there is only the University of Nairobi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> secondly, right. uh, it's, <laughs> it's important, he looks like. <laughs> secondly, I he wanted to say this that uh, uh, for young you people out that. there uh, <laughs> it's important for us to actually just know one thing that the king will be meeting young people later on mm -hmm. as he meets young people 
uh, what is happening today means that 60 years is not a very long time. Okay. There have been generational handovers. Even as we look at this, it should be for young people a way of looking back where we've come from, where we are, and help us pitch forward. Okay. So if you listen to us on TV here, uh, all of us come here, come with a toothpick, pick what is actually correct, and then pick the others you can actually discard. Otherwise, if you are to buy a lot of what we say here wholesomely, especially the doomsayers and I, the lamentas. I, I think they should pick more you, of what we say than Malifa The, the, the <laughs> lamentas and the doomsayers. You know, but at the end are, of it all, and, and that is yeah. why, uh, you know, your analysis as an individual will be different from... Yes, I know. Uh, that's what know. I'm actually saying. They should be more, much more of optimists of where we are going. This country is open. At independence, only 840,000 okay. were in school. Today we have got 14 million. We've right. made progress. Okay. Arnold Maliba, public policy analyst, Professor Fred Ogola, governance and political strategist, among many other hats, as well as Wakili Suleiman Bashir, lawyer, governance analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us this uh, morning as we look ahead uh, to this day, which would be the second day of the royal visit here in the country of the four state uh, day visit. Uh, what do we expect today? Well, we expect, uh, among other many things in the king's itinerary is that they are going to visit the Nairobi National Park and this is to appreciate uh, Kenya's uh, diverse wildlife. Uh, we also know that uh, they will be heading to Mombasa uh, today I believe yes uh, before they, they will be heading to Mombasa at the coast Her Majesty the Queen will spend time with survivors of gender-based violence while His Majesty the King will engage with religious leaders who are working with the UK funded programs to promote community cohesion as well as a number of other events that have been lined up will be joining our reporters who are following up on that as well. But I'm just going to take another short break here on AM Live. When we come back, of course, we promise to give you a rolling coverage of the Royal Visit. Uh, but that's it from uh, this panel, at least. Thank you, gentlemen, once again for making time. Uh, my name is Enabis Miles. Stay with us and uh, enjoy the rest of your viewing.